Hi, Brian Miller Hicks here with my continuing series of PowerPoints on earth science and geology. We're going to focus on ocean and land. What do I mean by that? Well, that means the often combative relationship between the shoreline and our great seas, our great oceans. As you well know, storms come in from the oceans and batter the land frequently. Land doesn't have much to fight back. Occasionally, we'll, it'll send a lava flow into the water or a landslide, but generally speaking, the sea is always battering at our shoreline, making various landforms while it does so. Depositional landforms like beaches, barrier islands, erosional landforms like wave cut terraces, uh, undercut cliffs, um, art, sea arches. Okay, so I want to start out by talking about the movement of water, and this has to do with the movement of water over the entire ocean. First, the ocean surface. The ocean surface circulation of moving water is water that is moves in currents, surface currents, cold currents, and warm currents. Um, driven by wind in part, but also helped along by the Earth's rotation and what we know as, of as the Coriolis effect. In this graphic map, I show a portrayal of global surface ocean currents. The blue arrows and lines are cool currents. For example, off the California coast, we have the cool California current. Um, off the Atlantic coast, we have the warmer Gulf Stream, which is very important in keeping temperatures moderate in northern Europe and England. So again, these are primarily wind-driven currents and have to do with also with temperature variations. Um, and they're constantly moving. They move in rotational fashion because as the Earth rotates or spins around its axis, it deflects currents. So anytime you see a current going in the northern hemisphere, the Coriolis effect makes it deflect to the right, and in the southern hemisphere makes it deflect to the left. I'm not going to get into a detailed explanation of the Coriolis effect. A little bit hard to do in a PowerPoint visual presentation without drawing stuff and um, reading extra material on the effects of that effect. The other part of ocean circulation is deep currents. Uh, water moves deep in the ocean and this set of currents, this type of water movement, deeper currents, is driven primarily by temperature differences. Down here you see cool subsurface flow. Now as you know, cooler water is denser, tends to sink. So from Antarctica and from the Arctic, cool water sinks and it comes around in a huge global circulation pattern as water comes from the Antarctic and goes north, it'll gradually warm and become a warm surface current because warm water is less dense, so it rises closer to the surface. This is an extremely important uh, phenomenon in nature and for us and for all life on Earth. Without the global conveyor belt, we could have disastrous effects. It's thought that sometime in the in the geologic past that this circulation belt conveyor belt shut down and the result was disastrous for life. Many um, species became extinct. It's important because the conveyor belt distributes nutrients, it distributes oxygen, and it distributes heat um, and keeps the temperature of the waters of the ocean somewhat in balance. Without this water movement distributing nutrients, sea life, 
depending on the circulation of nutrients, would have a hard time. Weather patterns would change, and we actually don't know exactly what disastrous effects would accumulate, but it's not, a, not likely an inviting scenario. On the surface, going back to the surface, everybody knows what a wave is, right? A wave is a mass of water that's driven by wind, primarily. We're not talking about tsunami here. We're talking about waves that have a short base uh, that don't go all the way to the sea bottom, and they're driven by wind. If you look at how an object behaves as it's floating on top of a wave, you'll note that in this example, we have a toy boat that moves up with this wave up to the crest, balances on the top of the crest, and comes down this side of the wave. So the net effect of this toy boat is it goes around in sort of a circular fashion as the wave moves under it. This illustrates that a wave is not actually moving in and of itself, but the energy is being transferred through the water, forming waves at certain spots, and then the wave and the wave energy passes, you get a crest or a high point and then a low point, which is called a trough. What happens when waves get close to the shore? Okay, out here in the open ocean, we have deep water. Waves have a wavelength. The wavelength is the distance between crest, one crest of a wave and the crest of another wave, or distance between trough a low part of the wave and the low part of the next wave. Okay, down here we have something called the wave base, this dashed line. The depth of the wave base, general rules, um, the physics of it works out to be that the depth of the wave base is one half the wavelength. So if you have a wavelength, let's say, of 30 feet between this crest and this crest, then the wave base is 15 feet down. Below that wave base, you will not detect movement that can be attributed to waves. So if a summer, let's say there's a big storm on the ocean surface, if a submarine wanted to escape the influence of the, that storm and didn't want to be pummeled by waves, then it would submerge itself below the wave base where there's quiet water. Up above the wave base, everything's moving. Um, as I've illustrated with a toy boat, the particles of water and whatever is caught up in the water will move in a circular fashion as the waves roll along. Now, as waves approach the shore, they touch bottom. What happens to the speed of the wave as it touches the bottom? Well, as a wave touches the bottom, the bottom part of the wave will slow down because of friction. The top will keep going at the same speed because there's no friction up here or very little friction in the open air. So gradually the bottom of the wave slows down, the top of the wave keeps its speed up, and the effect of this is that the top of the wave starts to overtake the bottom, starts to lean over, eventually will break at a certain depth into a, into a line of surf, surf waves. So the rule of thumb here is that the depth of water at which a wave starts breaking is 1 20th or 5% of the wavelength distance. You also note here that the wavelength becomes less and less as waves approach shore. They become, waves become sort of stacked up, stacked up behind each other, sort of like a traffic jam as traffic slows, um, traffic crunches together, if you will. What happens when waves reach the shore? In, uh, in a plan view, looking at it as if we're flying from an airplane, flying in an airplane or a helicopter, let's look at this, these waves coming in. As they approach shore, they reach this rocky point called a headland, and they start to break on this rocky point. They're attacking this rocky point from all sides, from this side, 
from this side and straight on. They are battering this rock and eroding it. But the breaking of the waves and the battering of the waves against the rock tends to rob them of their energy. They slow down. And as they fan out towards the um, interval between headlands, the wave speed decreases, the energy spreads out, and the waves come gently in. So this is a situation of erosion here. And this is a situation of deposition because waves losing their energy will drop their load of sediment and build a beach like you see here. It's called refraction. Littoral drift is a concept which helps us understand how beaches are built in long, continuous lines of sand sort of bordering the shoreline. So as waves come in, they bring sand in. And as waves go out, they bring some sand out. So in on the orange arrows, out on the blue arrows, the net effect of this movement constantly through the day, day after day, week after week, is that sand particles move down in this direction, which is called the longshore current direction. And that has a net effect of taking sand and spreading it um, parallel to shore to form these long linear beaches. Let's talk about some other landforms that we see at shorelines. So we see erosional landforms. This is British Columbia. This is it's, it's kind of a neat illustration where this um, sandstone, I believe, has been battered and eroded by waves. They've cut away material here and hollowed out this sandstone and actually converted the form of this sandstone into a wave-like form. I just think it's an interesting picture. So that's an erosional landform. Here's an, another erosional landform where we have a cliff that the waves are working on. And as the waves work on it, they cut into the base of this cliff. So that weakens the entire cliff and you can get a failure of rock slabs plunging into the ocean as they become eroded at the base. And you may have huge slabs of rocks peeling away and falling down. So through time, waves can make a shoreline move back. This is called shoreline retreat. So originally, the cliff was out here. And many years later, the material has been removed. And now we have the cliff line way back here. OK. This is a photo of an example of a wave cut cliff, a wave cut notch. See, it's notched out here, um, and you have a beach in front. Um, now, beaches actually can act as uh, buffers for erosion. If you have a rocky coastline where there's no beach, then the waves come in really hard and batter those rocks. But if you have a beach, then beaches absorb a lot of that energy so that the waves are gentler and less erosive. Here's some beautiful examples of sea cliff retreat and erosional landforms caused by interaction of ocean and land. These are arches. This is an arch at Pfeiffer Beach, California. Yeah. And closer to home for those of us who live in San Diego, Sunset Cliffs, and similar arch in Iceland. Prin simple principle is that waves battering these rocks day after day, year after week after week, year after year, will concentrate on weak points in the rock. Let's look at these fractures here. The dark line is a fracture in the rock. Here's another one. So waves will attack these fractures. And as they penetrate those fractures, the pressure of the water within those fractures is really powerful. The water gets squeezed in these tight little spaces 
and it becomes faster and more powerful as it does so. That causes a lot of erosion that eventually may cause a fracture to widen out and deepen, and it may turn into a big notch, uh, a sea cave, or if it goes all the way through the rock, it will become a sea arch, as you see here. Depositional landforms. A beach is a depositional landform, as we've explained in areas where the waves come in more gently but still carrying sand, still have enough energy to carry sand, they'll leave it right by the shoreline and we get our beautiful beaches as a result. Other types of depositional landforms include these that you see here. This is called a bay mouth bar. All right. As the waves come in, they hit shallow water, they lose energy, and they drop their sand and build these long linear bars of sand. Call them sandbars, call them bay mouth bars, because this one goes all the way across a bay. This little notch that you see here is caused by tidal forces. As you know, the ocean has low tides and it has high tides. In times of high tides, the tide can possess enough energy to break through these bars and cause a cut or a breach. And here you see sand deposited on the quiet side as the water slows down. Here's another depositional landform called a spit. This is a product of longshore current or littoral drift. So if the longshore current is going from the bottom of the picture to the top, as the current moves parallel to shore, it slows down as it curves into this little bay here. And as it slows down, it starts to drop sand and we get a hook-like sandbar feature like you see here, a spit. This is a map of some very famous barrier islands off the coast of North Carolina. Um, cape Hatteras is here, it's a famous cape, Cape Lookout. Um, these are um, formed by wave action, dropping sand. They're not the best place to build buildings or homes or houses or anything else because really you should look at them as temporary. However, this is a fairly populated um, area here. People have built their homes and buildings on this. It's a constant battle to, to fight against large storms and there's many protective measures and barriers being put up. But um, you get a huge hurricane and this is a coast that is prone to hurricanes. It can cause a lot of damage if your building is sitting on top of a barrier island. Other coastal landforms. Let's look at this up top here. We have an island sitting out a ways from the shore, and we have a sea arch here. I know that's hard to see. Here's a sea arch. I showed you some previous examples. As waves come in and hit this island, they again, they slow down because they're pounding their energy on this rock island. So that means they dump sand behind the island. That forms a landform that's sort of an elongated beach um, starts behind the island and goes all the way into shore. It's called a tombolo, T-O-M-B-O-L-O. Um, as waves attack this point, this promontory, and this arch, they can uh, break through the arch and actually make it collapse so that now we don't have an arch anymore. We have a sea stack an isolated piece of rock. You see, uh, well, there's no photo. And through time, keep in mind, the ocean doesn't like things sticking out into it. It doesn't like headlands. It doesn't like um, islands. It doesn't like um, rock interfering with its movement. So it's going to attack those points. Eventually, what, it, what the ocean wants to do is make the shoreline as smooth and uniform as possible so that you may end up over time with something like this with a long uniform parallel shoreline with a nice uniform even beaches along it. 
I mentioned tides. Now, how are tides formed and what causes tides? Well, there's two main bodies in our neighborhood of the solar system that are primarily responsible. Those are the sun and the moon. When the sun, sun on this side, and the moon are on the same side of the planet, they pull on the ocean. They actually do pull on the ocean water. That pulls the water out in a bulge that we call a tide. So when we have both moon and sun on the same side, that's a maximum pull. pull. So we have a solar tide and a lunar tide added together. The high tides are um, such that we have what we call a spring tide. Now, if the sun is on one side and the moon is on another, we have lower tides in general. We call those neap tides. Now, tides happen at least twice a day in most areas, sometimes more frequently. And they have the, the height of tides, the timing of tides, configuration of tides has a lot to do with water depth at the shore, the conf conformation or the configuration of shorelines, and the pull of sun and the moon, of course. The Earth actually rotates through these bulges of water, okay? The tides are pulled by the sun and the moon, and the Earth revolves through these tides so that you get, the Earth turns once in 24 hours, so it goes through one high tide, one low tide, one high tide, one low tide. Sometimes tides can be powerful enough to, as I mentioned, break through a barrier island or a sandbar. This is called a tidal delta, so the waves rushing through this breach will dump sand into this quiet lagoon of water behind the sandbar. Some tides can be extreme, depending again on the shape of the of the shoreline, the shape of perhaps a bay that the tides rush into. So at the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, Canada, tide heights can be as tide variations between high tide and low tide can be as great as 50 feet. It doesn't really show up here. This is maybe, I don't know, 12 feet difference between this tide and this tide. Here's another place where we have extreme tides. This is Mont Saint-Michel in France. It's a medieval, it's an island with a medieval castle complex or monastery complex built on it. Tides are quite extreme and they can range from uh, up to about 45 feet. So here's low tide. Tourists can walk along this causeway to visit the buildings here. When it's high, everything is flooded, 14 meters, which is about 45 feet. Okay. So what do we do about all these attacks that the ocean launches at us? The tides, the storms, the hurricanes, the big waves. Well, we can't protect ourselves to some extent. And in this time of understanding and realizing the effects of climate change, and sea level rise, it's especially important to think about these things and how we can protect ourselves, and our structures, and our lives from attacks by the ocean. Believe it or not, they're going to be coming. So here's a coastline in New Jersey. These structures here that you see projecting outward are called groins. They can be built of piles of rock, they can be built of concrete. They can be built of concrete with steel in them. Um, they're to protect and preserve beaches, primarily. So the long shore drift, um, long shore drift here is going from top to bottom. So the current carrying sand hits this groin, dumps sand behind it. Then it hits another groin, dumps, dumps sand behind it. You'll notice as we go from here down to here, the beaches get progressively 
more narrow and more narrow and more narrow. That's because most of the sand gets caught by the upcurrent structures. So most of the sand gets dumped up in here, which starves the beaches down below. So the uh, solution is to talk to your neighbors and maybe have them reduce the length of these groins. But it's an issue that can get complicated and political pretty fast, especially in New Jersey. This is another type of, of uh, shoreline protection structure. It's called a breakwater. So the function of a breakwater is to protect these white dots, which are in this area. The white dots being boats, the waves coming in hit this breakwater and that absorbs their energy and the boats are protected. The breakwater can again be built of rock or concrete, concrete and steel. An unintended effect of something like this is when the waves hit the breakwater, energy drops, the waves drop sand, and you can actually have sand building back out. And it may build out so far that it hampers um, the area where the boats are anchored, and maybe they have to dredge out sand continuously because it's filling up. Seawalls are another structure to protect against waves. This is a not, a not a bad looking one made of rock, protecting this house, absorbing wave energy. Here in San Diego, where I'm at, these are seawalls that are not very attractive. Um, this kind of ragged looking structure here is a bunch of rocks piled up on each other. And then the voids are filled in with concrete. And this is a concrete shell on the slope. Here's another concrete shell on a slope with a nice walkway. The intent, of course, is to protect structures against wave energy and erosion. These aren't very good solutions. They don't last too long. So we're looking at a shell, a thin shell of concrete, only a few inches thick, and it's constantly being battered by waves. So they don't last very long, 10, 15 years maybe. This concrete is actually shot against the slope in a semi-liquid form, and it forms only a thin shell. For those of you who live on the East Coast or have been to Florida, this is Miami Beach back in the 50s, I believe, before what we call beach restoration. So these are nice, big, touristy resort hotels built along Miami Beach with the groins built out to hopefully preserve and accumulate sand. Not working too well. This has a very narrow beach. Um, that's not good. Tourists want to go to Florida, want to go to Miami Beach to sit on the beach. So what's the solution here? Well, the city fathers, the developers, the builders brought in sand from elsewhere. They trucked in sand, just build the beaches bigger. Now we have a nice broad beach. Unintended consequence here is that some of the fine material that's contained in the sand that was brought in actually would drift out into the water and over uh, and coat or settle on top of some of the coral reefs that are out here, killing some of the coral reefs. That's not a good idea. So that's shoreline in a nutshell. Um, so thank you.